Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We are about to begin the next session. Wonderful, I'm going to get started and good afternoon to everyone. And welcome to Miami Book Fair. As I look out, um, I see many of you who have been with us all morning. And uh, I'm sure there are many who have been with us since last Sunday. Am I right? Who, who opened the fair with us last Sunday? Wonderful. I am Malu Harrison, and it's truly a pleasure to welcome you to Miami Book Fair 2017. And as uh, other guests are coming in, let me also pay a special welcome, as always, conveying our gratitude to the circle of friends of Miami Book Fair. And with your support, we are able to continue this outstanding cultural and literary event for the community and also for the visitors that come from near and far for this book fair during the month of November. As you may know, the book fair is really year-round. So I hope that you do visit us all year long, but particularly for this seven-day extravaganza of wonderful authors, booksellers, presenters, chefs, and, um, and many other literary um, enthusiasts. So thank you for being here. I also want to, at this time, ask, as always, that you silence your devices so that we can all enjoy the program. And so to help me introduce our speaker, please help me to welcome Mr. Javier Granda, who's the general counsel of South Motors. Javier? Good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of South Motors, Miami Dade College, and of course, the Miami Book Fair, we welcome and we're very pleased to have you here. South Motors is a family company that's been around for over 60 years with a commitment to treating every customer like family. Another commitment that the family made from the very beginning was a commitment to give back to the community through events such as this. It is our pleasure to have someone like Walter Isaacson here. Uh, it is a pleasure to have someone of his magnitude and of his knowledge and wealth of experience to have someone like you here. Oh, my notes are blanking out. Walter is the university professor of history at Tulane, a former CEO of the Aspen Institute, chairman of CNN, and the managing editor of Time Magazine. He is the author of The Innovators, how a group of hackers, geniuses, and geeks created the digital revolution. Kissinger, a biography. Steve Jobs. Einstein, his life and universe. Benjamin Franklin, an American life. And of course, now Walter brings to life Leonardo da Vinci for us. And without further ado, Walter, please. Thank you, Javier. Thank you, Eduardo Padron. Thank you all from the Miami Book Fair. I've been here for every book, and it's always a great pleasure to be in this city. One reason it's great to be in Miami is that like so many other cities of this world, it has now become a mix of very creative people with a tolerance for all sorts of people. And that was what made Leonardo da Vinci so creative. You know, I've written about a lot of smart people. And at a certain point, it occurs to me that smart people are a dime a dozen. They don't usually amount to much, right? It takes being innovative, imaginative, and creative. And one recipe for that is being able to stand at the intersection of arts and sciences, to love both the humanities and engineering. I remember watching Steve Jobs give his product presentations. He would always end with that street sign of the liberal arts meeting technology and say, that's where creativity lies. And I thought, yeah, that's what Ben Franklin did. Even Einstein would pull out his violin and play Mozart when he was having trouble with his equations, saying that music and art help connect him to the spirit of the cosmos 
and the harmony of the spheres. But the ultimate of that, and the person I decided should be the capstone of a series of books about creativity and how to achieve it, is Leonardo da Vinci. Now, Leonardo had the great good fortune to be born out of wedlock. <laughs> had he been legitimate born, he would have been a notary, like his father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and great-great-grandfather. Leonardo loved, as he grew up in the tiny village of Vinci there, to blend fantasy and reality. He loved to think out of the box. He loved to do things different. All the things you do not want in your notary. <laughs> but it did help him become a creative artist and engineer who loved the patterns of nature. Also, by being born out of wedlock, it meant he wasn't sent to one of the uh, universities or Latin schools to have his head crammed, filled with the dusty scholasticism of the Middle Ages. And so he got to become what he called a disciple of experience, meaning he did experiments. He always questioned whatever he was told and decided he was going to see if it was right. He wasn't going to re accept received wisdom. So even as a little kid in Vinci, those streams running down to the Arno, he put rocks in them and see how the water rippled. And the swirl of water becomes one of the many patterns in nature that become his passion, and we see it throughout his life. He looked at things that you and I saw when we were age 10 and asked questions about, like why is the sky blue? And when a bird takes off, does its wings go up faster or down faster? But Leonardo, unlike us, never outgrew his wonder years. He was the most insatiably curious person in history. And that is key number one to his creativity. We can see in his notebooks every week weird questions he decided he needed to know. Not just why is the sky blue, but why does water swirl the way it does when it goes into a basin or a pond? Or what is the size of the sun and how would you measure it? And my favorite, what does the tongue of a woodpecker look like? I try to imagine what it would be like one morning and put in your notebook, describe the tongue of the woodpecker. I mean, why would you even care? How would you even know, you know, open up a woodpecker? But that's Leonardo. If it struck his curiosity, he put it in his notebook and he tried to learn everything. By age 12, his father brings him to Florence, a town like the towns I've been talking about, one of those creative cities in which all sorts of people worked together. Leonardo was lucky. He was born the same year that Gutenberg opened his print shop and spread it to Florence. So in his notebooks, we see Leonardo saying, go down to the stationers by the bridge and buy the translation of Euclid or get the anatomy book. All these things he wanted to learn. Also, Constantinople fell that year he was born. So people are coming from the Arab world, bringing mathematics. And Leonardo is quite a misfit. Besides being illegitimate, he's left-handed, he's gay, he's a vegetarian, he's a bit of a heretic, and they love him in Florence. It was under Lorenzo de' Medici and the Medici family, one of those places where people of diverse backgrounds all fit in, a live and let live place. Leonardo worked in a workshop of Andrea Verrocchio. And some people call it an artist studio, but it was much more than that. And that was another secret to Leonardo. He loved to do everything. Look at the famous Duomo. You all know the Duomo there, the dome that Brunelleschi builds on the top of the Florence Cathedral. There's a copper ball on it. And Leonardo, when he was a very young apprentice in the shop of Verrocchio, helps solder the copper ball, and he draws all the mechanisms they use to put it on top of the dome. It is the ultimate connection that he makes his whole life between art and science, between beauty and engineering. Among the things that they do in the workshop 
are pageants and plays. And Leonardo loves them. He's a good-looking kid and kind of proud of how good-looking he is. We know how good-looking he is. Verrocchio did a statue of David, a young 12-year-old David. And the young 12-year-old Leonardo is right there in the center being sketched by somebody else in the workshop posing for David. And in the plays they do, they do costumes. And one of Leonardo's first sketches, uh, etchings, a silver point there on the left, the craggy old warrior, another uh, drawing that he liked, juxtaposed with the angelic young warrior, something we see Leonardo doing his whole life, but he's doing it as a set of costumes for the visit of the Duke of Milan. Verrocchio did the relief on the right, Leonardo did the drawing on the left, but you can see how they mix fantasy and reality. Dragon's head, yet also the wings of a bat that are scientifically accurate. And everywhere in it, those curls and swirls that Leonardo liked. He even does it for his engineering, the curls and the swirls. He's sort of famous. People say, didn't he invent the helicopter? This drawing here is a famous drawing. Well, yeah, except for it was done, too, for a play. It was done to bring the angels down from the rafters in one of the plays that Leonardo produced. Because sometimes we don't focus on the fact that producing plays and doing pageants was a big job back then. They didn't have TV. They didn't have movies. So there were pageants and plays each night, and Leonardo loved it because it blurred the line between fantasy and reality. In fact, he so much loves blurring that line between fantasy and reality that once he does drawings like this of the helicopter, he decides, well, maybe I'll make a real flying machine. So as you know, for a long period of his life, he's trying to design flying machines. And he makes a great glider. He also can never make a man-powered flying machine that will take off. So he studies birds and the flight of birds to figure out why they have a different weight ratio to their muscles, realizes it's impossible. Another small lesson from Leonardo. Sometimes you should try to do the impossible, because at least you'll find out why it can't be done. But two, he is a painter, because that's one of the things they do in the workshop. And he becomes such a good painter that the legend is Verrocchio got so awed by him that Verrocchio decided never to paint again, just have Leonardo handle the painting in the studio. In this, the baptism of Christ, we see one of the patterns that we'll see throughout Leonardo's life. This is when Leonardo is very young. Verrocchio does most of the painting, but Leonardo does that river, the River Jordan, coming from the ancient eons of time and flowing into the bodies. In this case, literally, as John the Baptist pours the water over Jesus. And if you look carefully, and I thank Simon & Schuster, my publisher, because they use such high-quality paper that you can see the color reproductions throughout. If you look at the ripples next to the ankles of Jesus, you see how scientifically accurate it is. The kid who loves that rippling water knows how to turn it into both engineering and to art. But most importantly, in his notebooks around this time, Leonardo is saying the goal of a painter should also be to express the inner emotions through outward gestures and outward expressions. And so the angel on the far left is Leonardo's. The one next to him, Verrocchio did. You look at Leonardo's angel, there's all sorts of deep emotions as we see the twist of the neck and the expression of the face. Things that he had sketched in his notebook as he walked around town, seeing how people express different forms of awe and other emotions. The one that Verrocchio painted next to him, about the only expression on that angel's face, as you can see, is, how did I get here next to this far more beautiful <laughs> angel? We see, too, even in his first portrait, that ability to show emotions on a face as somebody turns. Ginevra da Benci, this is, the wife of a cloth merchant in Florence in three-quarters profile, with a river, again, coming down and connecting us to nature, connecting from the ancient mountains 
the river curving, the way he loved those curls, into the blood of humans, connecting us to the world. This is not the Mona Lisa, even though it's a cloth merchant's wife and three-quarter profile with expressions in a river. He wouldn't paint the Mona Lisa until the end of his life. And it was only after doing a lot more anatomy and a lot more science and a lot more geology that other art historians say it's a shame he wasted his time doing all this math and geology and science and anatomy because he could have painted more paintings. Well, that's true. But if he hadn't done all those patterns of nature and been so enriched about being curious about everything, I don't think he ever would have gotten from Ginevra da Vinci to the Mona Lisa, which is the culmination of a lifetime spent finding the patterns of nature. He also used his theatrical knowledge to do paintings. Here in the Adoration of the Magi, also done when he was young and in Florence, we don't just see a scene, we see that swirl he loves, a curving spiral, and it's a drama, it's a stage drama, in perspective, as if it were on a stage, with the second king offering the gift at the very bottom, swirling up to the first king, who's already bowing down, and each person in the spiral, their expression, is reflective of the person before them. It was very complicated, and Leonardo doesn't finish the painting. And that happens to Leonardo often. He puts things aside, flying machines that don't fly, tanks that don't roll, paintings that he puts aside. He actually gives it to the family of Amerigo Vespucci, the guy who's about to go discover America at the time. And I don't think he just gave up on paintings, but I think he always thought that maybe he would learn more and he could apply yet another brush stroke, whether it was the Mona Lisa, which he kept for 16 years, or the Adoration of the Magi, which he gives to the friends to hold for him, and he never fully gets back to it. This notion of always finding another brush stroke we see in St. Jerome, a painting he did around the same time, uh, St. Jerome in the Wilderness, and it's unfinished, but you can see that about 20, 30 years later, after he had put the painting aside, he does some more anatomy experiments and he dissects human corpses and gets the neck muscles exactly right in his anatomy drawings on the far right here. And he goes back to his St. Jerome painting and redoes the neck muscles of that painting. So what you see in Leonardo is somebody who procrastinates, which makes him a bad notary, Somebody who sometimes will let the perfect be the enemy of the good, like Steve Jobs, who wouldn't ship the original Macintosh because the circuit board inside wasn't pretty. And so they held it up until they could make the circuit board that nobody would ever see pretty. Likewise, Leonardo often just holds on to his drawings and says, I will learn something more. I'll be able to make it better. The way that I sort of understood that was not just by looking at his paintings, which other people have written about so brilliantly, but I decided to use as the foundation for this book his notebooks. I didn't realize until about 20 years ago when I was wandering around, my wife had studied in Florence art history, and we saw all the paintings. We go to Italy quite a bit, but I kept stumbling across in the archives and bibliotheques in Italy uh, his notebook pages. And I realized that that was the clue to how his mind danced around different subjects. Just take a simple, not simple, but a page like this. First of all, marvel how good of a technology paper is for the storage and retrieval of information. 500 years later, we can still see it. 50 years from now, your Facebook posts and your tweets, fortunately, are not gonna be retrievable, but paper, it's really good. The operating system never goes out. So on the center left, you see that craggy warrior that he's always drawing. But you see a tree trunk branching into the torso of the warrior. As Leonardo's mind goes through something he's been thinking about, which is the analogy between nature and humans. And especially what we could call Leonardo's law of branching, which is when there's a branch of a tree or branches, 
the cross-section of the areas of the branches totals up to the cross-section of the trunk. And that's true of rivers and their tributaries. It's true of our arteries. And so Leonardo is making those connections. In the top left, he's making the connections between the swirls of water he loves and curls of hair. He writes about curls of hair have the same spiral form. And by the way, he even makes a stab at the math of Fibonacci's equation. As for math, he's always trying to transform one shape into a different shape, but with the same area. A problem sometimes called squaring the circle, which is to make a square the exact same area as a given circle, using only a ruler and a protractor. An ancient mathematical puzzle that's not actually totally solvable, because pi is a very irrational number. But Leonardo tries all sorts of visual ways throughout his life to square the circle. And you can see it up there. And finally, on the left, there's his mirror script. He's writing from right to left, because he taught himself to write. And he's a left-hander. And so he doesn't want to smudge the ink. So it's in mirror script. And you see the list of things he wants to learn that week, weird things like inflate the lungs of a pig and see whether they expand in length as much as in width. And you go, you got to be kidding. <laughs> but he's turning 30 when he does this. And at the very bottom left is a recipe for using the husks of certain types of nuts and boiling them in oil in order to make a tawny, in other words, uh, blondish hair dye. And suddenly you say, man, the guy is human, kind of vain about his appearance, those beautiful curly locks, and he's worried about going gray. That's our Leonardo. Around that time, too, he finds a companion of his life, Salai, a nickname for the little devil. Salai is able to be sort of a bit of a petty thief and everything else, but Leonardo likes him, and that's how he gets his nickname. And throughout his life, we can watch Salai with his beautiful curly hair age and see him in the notebooks and as part of Leonardo's life. But at that period of turning 30, maybe starting to turn gray, his father, the notary, had notarized the contracts for two of the paintings he hadn't delivered, the Adoration in St. Jerome. And so you can kind of imagine that maybe it was time to move on, time to leave wonderful Florence. And what he does is he goes as part of a cultural delegation to Milan. Because Florence was not a great military power. It was even able to lose battles to Pisa, which was probably hard to do. <laughs> but it had a lot of influence because of what you might call, we might, Joe Nye calls soft power, cultural diplomacy. It would send its engineers and architects and artists to do things like the Sistine Chapel or build buildings in Venice. And in 1482, there's a big delegation that goes from Florence to Milan, sent by the Medici family to the Duke of Milan, that is led by a playwright and a poet. It has an architect, artist, uh, artists, engineers. And of all things, Leonardo goes as a musician because he does everything, especially because he loves theater. So he has invented musical instruments, including one called a lira de braca, a lyre for the arm, like a violin, but he made it in the shape of a horse's head. And so he brings it to Milan as a gift, as part of that cultural delegation. But he kind of wants to stay there, needs the new horizons. And he's a little bit tired of being just a painter. He's been blocked on the last couple of paintings he's done. So he writes one of the coolest job application letters in history to the Duke of Milan. And it's 11 paragraphs long. And the first 10 paragraphs are all about engineering and science. He says, I can make great weapons of war. Something he hadn't really done, but he had sketched out a lot of them, including the large crossbow. He says, I can build great buildings. I can divert rivers. It's only in the 11th paragraph, almost as an afterthought, when he says, and I can also paint as well as any person. Now, of course, he could. But he revels in the fact that when he gets to Milan, he eventually earns a position as the engineer and painter to the Duke of Milan. 
And he works on projects collaboratively. Because once again, I want to emphasize that creativity is a team sport. Innovation comes from collaboration. We think of Leonardo as going to a garret somewhere in the castle in Milan and maybe doing his great drawing like Vitruvian Man or his paintings. But in fact, he worked with a lot of other people, especially in the court of Milan. His really close friend, Luca Pacioli, the great mathematician. Leonardo does dr the drawings for his math book on divine proportion. And Leonardo gets a feel for the divine proportions useful in art. He also works with architects and engineers. And his first real big thing that he does is work with three or four friends on helping fix up the Milan Cathedral. Like Steve Jobs, Leonardo believed that simplicity was a soul of beauty. As you're looking at this Milan Cathedral, you're probably thinking, this is not the soul of beauty. This is a Gothic monstrosity. But Leonardo and his friends are asked to help design the Tiberio. This, I can't quite show it, but the little lantern tower on top. And they come up with a simple geometric design of a circle, octagonal, and square. And as you can tell, the authorities in Milan don't build it. They build a Gothic monstrosity instead. But in working on it, Leonardo has become very close friends with three or four other architects and engineers, most notably Donato Bramante. The cool thing is, Bramante painted a picture of the two of them together. That's Bramante on the right, round-faced, balding. And there's Leonardo on the left, his short purple tunics that he loved to wear, the notebook in front of him with the mirror script going from right to left. The, he was always said to have had a muscular, well-built, well-proportioned athletic body, that chiseled face, and of course, the wonderful flowing curly locks of blonde, or maybe dyed blonde, hair. <laughs> and so they go off and they decide to do church design. And what they like is the very symmetrical, very simple designs. These are Leonardo's drawings in his notebooks of how you really should do a building or a church. It should be proportional to a human. He wants to connect the human to nature, but also to the spirit. And the Renaissance, as you know, was partly a rebirth of classical knowledge. If you've read the great book, The Swerve by Stephen Greenblatt, you know that the rediscovery of Lucretius is part of the Renaissance. Well, for Bramante and his friends and Leonardo, there was a manuscript that had just been rediscovered by the ancient Roman architect Vitruvius. And Vitruvius writes about how buildings, especially churches and temples, should reflect the proportions of a human. And Vitruvius gives page after page, line after line, of the exact proportions of the human body, which Leonardo will say, as Vitruvius says, here are the proportions. Well, one thing I discovered in Leonardo's notebook is that ever since his childhood, he doesn't accept received wisdom. He's a disciple of his own experiments. So what he does in page after page of his notebooks is do proportions, working with his assistants to measure the chin to the cheekbone to the nose to the breast, sitting, standing, running, dozens and dozens, hundreds of proportions that he does. And with his friends, he's still geeking out, totally obsessive on the issue of squaring the circle. There's page after page of ways to do squares and circles, get them all the same area. And so having done that, they go down to Pavia, a town very close to Milan, where they're building a cathedral that's more to their liking, a very simple cathedral. And they all decide to go to the castle in Pavia and look at the manuscript there, because there's a copy of the manuscript of Vitruvius but it's unillustrated. So they are going to illustrate Vitruvian Man. Now we know Leonardo, but his friends also do it. There it is, the man in proportion, in the circle, in the square, in the church design, all fitting according to the proportions of Vitruvius. 
We see Francesco de Giorgio's drawings, Giacomo d'Andrea, who had a nice dinner where they were doing it, and Salai came. Leonardo brought his companion Salai, who spilled wine on the table. We know this from the notebooks. So we can imagine these guys doing it, looking at Salai, hoping that he doesn't spill wine. And then Leonardo, he does his version. Yeah, right. It's in a totally different league. As you look at Leonardo's Vitruvian Man, you can see it's a work of brilliant science. He takes the foot and puts it sideways to be the measurement, and everything in there is scientifically proportioned according to the measurements Leonardo made, and he gets it exactly accurate. But it's also a work of great math. Vitruvius had said that the navel should be at the center of the earth, but he also implies that the genitals are at the center of creation. So Leonardo puts a circle and the square on the same base. But as you can see, the circle goes up a little bit higher. So the navel is at the exact center of the circle. The genitals are at the center of the square. The circle goes up, and he's squaring the circle, making them the same area. But besides being a work of great science and great math, it is a work of unbelievable art, unnecessary beauty. I mean, remember what his friends are doing, you know, stick figures. And, little, and there's Leonardo <laughs> with his left-handed cross hatchings, making it awesomely beautiful. I went to the fourth floor of the Academy in Venice where they keep it in storage because it can't be exposed to light. My wife and I and the translator who was working with me, we had talked them into showing it to us. If you look at the dust jacket of my book, the author's picture in the back, there I am, leaning over Vitruvian Man, having walked up four flights of stairs in July in Venice in a unair conditioned building, so there's sweat. And I'm thinking, if I drop some sweat <laughs> onto this picture, 500 years from now, people will be saying, I wonder what Leonardo meant by that blot. So I was very careful, but you see, sharply incised lines. He knew exactly what he was doing. It's not some sketch. The protractor right in the center of the navel there. And you get a chill almost because you feel you're in the presence of the hand of the master. And then you look at the face, that face staring at you with emotion and intensity. And as you stare at it, your mind should go back to the things you've seen about Leonardo, you can look at that picture, yeah, and you realize that this, to some extent, is Leonardo drawing himself, standing naked, spread eagle, in the earth and in the cosmos and in the center of creation, asking, how do I fit in? This is what makes it the greatest drawing, connecting the art the sciences, the humanities, and the spirit, all in the curious mind saying, what am I doing here? How do I fit in? He does, throughout his time, anatomical drawings, but they're not just grapes of great anatomy, they also combine art and science, the visual display of information. As somebody who thought he could do weaponry, this is a map of Amola. He and Niccolo Machiavelli, his friend, and Caesar Borgia, the warlord, all spend the winter of 1502, a few months, in Amola, in what would be a great scene in a movie, if I may say, as Leonardo realizes that the greatest weapon of war is understanding where you are. And he paces off the streets with Salai, and then is able to do an aerial view, even though he doesn't have airplanes or balloons or drones. And it looks like a current map you would have of a military map. And if you read Machiavelli's The Prince, what he says of Borgia is that one of his great weapons was surprise. He always knew where he was and where the enemy was and what the terrain was better than any adversary. And all of this is part of it. And Leonardo and Machiavelli even cook up a scheme because Leonardo loves water in its flow ever since he was a little boy of diverting the Arno River so that Florence would go right to the sea. Why? Well, this is right after the 1490s. Suddenly, after 
America Vespucci and Christopher Columbus. It becomes important to be a seaport uh, if you're going to be part of the age of exploration. And also, if you can't beat Pisa militarily, you can divert the river so uh, you can sort of uh, starve them out. So it was one of his other great things. But all of the science, the art, and then the engineering and the theater come together in his paintings. In Milan, he does, of course, The Last Supper on a refractory wall of a monastery. And one of the things that's very noticeable is that it's the work of a theater designer. I mean, it's almost as if Jesus is saying, all right, everybody, get on this side of the table if you want to be in the picture the way you would on stage. But also the perspective lines are mathematically correct, all going from the vanishing point on the forehead of Jesus outward. You can see them radiate out. But the walls go back in an accelerated perspective way. Why? Well, imagine, look on stage here. Look at the scenery that you imagine a Leonardo would have done. The scenery comes in that way to make it look deeper. And it's not just a moment in time. Some art critics have said it's a little eerie because it seems like a frozen moment. Not to me. It feels like a sequential drama, a narrative drama. The monks coming in from the right and Jesus saying, one of you shall betray me. And you see it rippling out, the sound waves that he loved because he thought sound waves were like water waves. They rippled out. So the first group of apostles on either side of Jesus, they're already reacting with the next verse, the next part of the narrative. Is it me, Lord? Is it I who will betray you? And then it ripples further out as they're first hearing it and almost seems to bounce back the way ripples do. As Jesus says, he that dippeth his hand. And you see Judas there, sort of on the left, our left, dipping his hand. And then finally, as the narrative goes on, there's Jesus reaching for the bread and the wine and the institution of the Eucharist. So even in a still painting, we get a dramatic narrative. There are a few curious things about it, like the windows or in the way back, those three windows. And yet if you look at the light on the right wall or the front of the table or the shadows on the table, they're not coming from that back windows. You think, did he get it wrong? How could he have messed that up? And then you go visit the monastery in Milan, and you go into the room where it is, and you marvel at the picture. And then you look up to your left, and there in the real room is the only window. And you realize that it's a light coming in in midday from that window that Leonardo is using to light the right wall of the painting and the table with the shadows from it directly. That science of art and engineering also came together very, very famously a few days ago <laughs> with the half a billion dollars almost uh, of a sale. I write about this quite a bit in my book. I did not know it was going to go on sale, but I was mesmerized by this painting. Went to see it in London. Then, as you know, it went on sale at Christie's. It's called Salvador Mundi. And the reason I was mesmerized by it was it shows how Leonardo in the face blurs lines, knowing because he studied optics that we don't see at a distance like that sharp lines because we have two eyes and our retinas see at various points of the retina. And so there's nothing really sharp about the lines. But as things get closer to you, they get sharper. Look at the curls of Jesus, the spirals that Leonardo loved and the light luster. And as it gets to his chest, they get a little bit clearer. And then there's that right hand that's blessing us. And it is sharply delineated. Something Leonardo didn't usually do. Some people said maybe this, he didn't paint the whole thing because he wouldn't have painted a hand that sharp. But as I looked at his notebooks, he's writing a treatise on perspective. And he talks about perspective like in The Last Supper and how distance perspective works. And even how you do artificial perspective in a big painting like The Last Supper. But then he has a section called acuity perspective or sharpness perspective. And he writes about how if something's at a distance, it's not perfectly easy to see. I mean, the, the lines are blurred. But at a arm's length or so, it's the focal point of our eyes. 
And so lines are very sharp. So in doing it that way with the sharpness, he's making it look like the hand is coming out off the panel to bless us. He is doing one of his great contributions to art, which is making something look three-dimensional on a two-dimensional panel. And there's the crystal orb. Very scientifically accurate with the inclusions on the bottom, uh, bottom right of that orb. But there's something strange about it. If you think of a lens or solid crystal, even a bottle of Dasani water, I guess, and you think of your hand behind it like this or whatever, you can imagine, you can see, it's distorted, inverted a bit, like any lens. And yet, there, or if you look in my book, because it's a high quality reproduction, or I want to see it and look very carefully, there is not the tiniest bit of distortion in Jesus' robes. Why is that? Well, it could be, well, he just didn't know. No, nah, that's ridiculous. Uh, even as a kid, he's doing that copper ball and showing how light waves hit curved objects, how they back. Then he's doing lenses, he's studying crystal for Isabella d'Este. So we know he knows. It could be he knows it, but he thinks it'll be too distracting. You have a beautiful picture and all of a sudden the robes are a bit off and people will be distracted so he doesn't do it. Maybe. The other thing is it's Salvador Mundi and he's showing the miraculous quality. He's showing a miracle that nothing he touches is ever distorted. The good thing about Leonardo is you can be your own uh, thinker of the mysteries and figure out what was in his head. Uh, he was not very close to uh, Michelangelo. In fact, when Michelangelo's statue of David is done, Leonardo's on the committee to figure out where to put it. And Leonardo wants it put, you know, sort of under the arches, where to now the Uffizi. But you can see in Leonardo's notebook, he also draws the statue. And if you look carefully, there's what Leonardo calls a detente ornamente, a decent ornament, i.e. a fig leaf covering up the genitals. Now, this is odd, because Leonardo was not that prudish about nudity. We have enough nude pictures and sketches of his. But there's something about Michelangelo that, and so the first 40 years that David is displayed, it has a brass fig leaf ornament covering it up because Leonardo wanted it that way. Um, one of the things that Leonardo does is see the patterns across nature, as I said, and this is from his heart drawings. He dissected the human heart and then dissected pig's hearts that were still beating because his dissections had begun to figure out things like how do I paint St. Jerome's neck, whatever it may be. But being Leonardo, it devolves into curiosity for curiosity's sake. He just wants to know everything. So he's dissecting the heart and he discovers a major discovery in science, which is how the heart valve works. People thought that the blood pumps from the heart into the aorta and it pushes the valve open and then the pressure from on top when enough blood's in there, it pushes it closed. And on this page on the left, Leonardo is saying no, that would crumple it. What happens is when fluid moves from a size chamber to a smaller one and hits the friction of the walls, it creates those spirals, the swirls of water that he so loved. And he says it's by the swirling water it spreads out the membrane, and that's why the heart valve membrane spreads out and closes. He even there has a glass device that he has shown that you can use to prove this. And indeed, he's right. That's how even our artificial heart valves now work because of this. But the thing about Leonardo is every now and then you're reminded that he's human. He's doing more and more drawings of the heart. He gets to his last page. He's doing another cross section on the bottom, and then he gets distracted, as he often does. His mind wanders, and he draws Salai with the heart inside of him, which I think is kind of sweet, and it reminds us yet again how human the guy is. But in all of his anatomy, it's always the connection of art and science. It's always the beauty of how we fit in to the creation. And it always has, from its earliest drawings to the end, this wonderful patterns of nature, like the water flowing into the bowl 
in the pond and causing swirls, the water going past an obstacle and becoming swirls when he was a kid, when he's di diverting the Arno River in middle age or trying to, and as an old man looking at the swirls and patterns of water. And it all comes together in one of the greatest pictures ever done. On the left, you see him dissecting the human eye to discover that the very center of the retina, the cones or the fovea, see black and white detail. And he knows from his own experiments and judgments and dissections that the edges of the retina tend to see color and shadows better. He also dissects the human face, so he knows every muscle and every, uh, that touches the human lips and every nerve that controls every muscle. He makes all sorts of discoveries about the muscles of the lips and the way they're shaped, even ones that you and I could have discovered had we retained our wonder years of being curious and being observant, such as the bottom lip is a muscle all on its own. You can pout it and move it on its own. Top lip is not a separate muscle. It only, if you can't pout it alone because it's connected with other muscles. I see people trying it. <laughs> if you're on C-SPAN, you are now looking ridiculous. <laughs> Wait till you get home, do it in front of a mirror when you're alone. But all of that anatomical knowledge, despite what the Kenneth Clarks and others said about being a waste of time, I think culminate, of course, in the greatest smile ever painted. With the Mona Lisa, you see the river again coming from the eons of time, connecting to the roads of civilization and then to us as humans. How do we fit in? But you, if you want, you can look at the eyes, they're amazing. But start with the lips. 16 years he spent putting layer after layer of the tiniest brush strokes of glaze, oil, which is the tiniest bit of uh, pigments in it, because the light will go all the way down to the primer coat and then bounce back. And he knows he can make it look interactive. And as he does the lips, he gets the muscles and the movement and the shadow exactly right. But he also makes it so that the tiniest black and white details, especially on our left, but even on our right, go straight. So if you're staring right at the corner of the lips, close up, the smile is elusive, kind of disappears on you. But if your eyes go back to her forehead or her chin or her cheek, suddenly the smile lights up again because you're seeing it with a different part of your eye. You're seeing it at very, so She's somebody who has emotional reactions, but they change. And as our emotion changes, she seems to interact with us as if it's augmented reality. It is a deep mystery of emotions being expressed by facial and other gestures and changing interactively with us. That's why, among many other things, it is a great connection of art to science, and a great masterpiece. He brings it with him after 16 years to France, where he's dying. His patron is Francis I, gives him a manor house next to the chateau, and there by his bed are three or four paintings, including the Mona Lisa, St. John the Baptist. He's still perfecting them. When I did Einstein, I looked at his last notebook page because I wanted to see what, did he, what was he doing that night in Princeton when his aorta's burst, he knows he's dying. He does two-thirds of a page of equations. Even though he's dying, he's still trying to get us a step closer to the unified theory that will connect electromagnetism to gravity. Even though he knows he's not going to be able to do it, he's still trying to do it. And Leonardo, on his last notebook page that we know of, He's still trying to square the circle. Using a trick of Euclid of a right triangle with different length legs and explains how maybe this will make a shape that you can then make a square and then make a circle and he has a chart in the middle showing how to do it. But the very last line, it pauses and then he writes, but the soup is getting cold. <laughs> you can imagine him up there in that bedroom with Meltzi and Salai and his cook, Madarine, and the rest of the entourage downstairs, and he's still struggling 
to get us one step closer to the spirit manifest in the laws of the universe. But the soup is getting cold. Thank you all. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, wow, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Isaacson. And uh, audience, if you would like to have a book autographed, uh, you may do so on the other side of the elevators, right on this floor. Thank you so much once more, Thank Mr. You Isaacson. Very much.